My name is Ann Sanders, and I'm the executive director of the Ford Hall Forum. And again, I want to thank all of you for being here. I also want to let you know that tonight's program is being sponsored by the WAND Education Fund. How many of you have been to a Ford Hall Forum program before? Oh, great. Well, to our old friends, we say thank you so much for coming. And to those of you who are here for the first time, I hope we see you again. The Fort Hall Forum, as those of you who are familiar with us uh, know, has been around for 96 years. And in, during that time, we have been engaging people in discussions and debates about the issues that are in the news and on our minds. Tonight, that tradition continues as we are privileged to have Eli Pariser, the executive director of MoveOn.org. This fall, the forum will continue to host a great roster of speakers and explore a, a range of issues. In fact, the, the yellow sheet of paper that was on your chair that you picked up gives you a preview of the programs coming up this fall. So make sure you're on our mailing list so that we can let you know more about what we're doing and things that are coming up even next year. And we'd appreciate it if you would take some time to complete the audience survey. Let us know what you think of our programs. And we'd appreciate it if you would make, if you'd like to make a suggestion about a particular speaker or an issue that you would like to hear more about. Many of the topics presented come to us as suggestions from audience members and colleagues. So if you have an idea, please share it. And there's one more thing you can do. While the Ford Hall Forum programs are always free and open to the public, they do cost us money to present. We depend on your support so we can continue providing these wonderful programs. Our annual memberships are $35 a year, and that has to be the best deal in town. So please become a supporter. We'd appreciate it. The, I'd like to thank uh, our generous corporation and foundation supporters, and those are the Lowell Institute, the Lincoln and Therese Filene Foundation, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, and Northeastern University, which serves as our home base. Tonight's program is being recorded. If during the second half of the program, you'd like to make a comment or ask a question, um, I'd like it if you would come up to this microphone that's in the center of the room so that your question can be heard by everybody. And please understand that by coming up and making a comment or asking a question, you are, in essence, giving us permission to record you. Finally, it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's moderator, moderator Susan Scher is Executive Director of WAND, Women's Action for New Directions, a national organization which empowers women to act politically, to reduce violence and militarism, and to redirect excessive military resources toward unmet human and environmental needs. She has been a political activist for many years on the local, national, and international scene. And in Massachusetts, she has been the Massachusetts um, League of Women Voters president and co-founded TEAM, the Tax Equity Alliance for Massachusetts. And in addition, Susan is the president of the Ford Hall Forum Board of Directors. Please join, join me in welcoming her to the program. Seriously, we want to make sure that you can hear everything, so if not, raise your hand uh, at any time during my remarks or Eli's. Uh, you might wonder why I'm the lucky one who gets to introduce Eli Pariser. Uh, you know, if we used the Move On model, we probably would have had an internet contest uh, to see who could come up with the most clever 60-second introduction and then all the members would vote on it, and it would become an ad in the New York Times and go viral. But, but um, I got lucky, and you are too, because you get to see live and in person, as well as on streaming video on WGBH, 
uh, somebody whose, whose name has just appeared at the bottom of millions of emails, and that is Eli. Um, I'm not only the president of the Fort Hall Forum, but I'm also the co-chair of Win Without War. And this is the anti-war in Iraq coalition that was founded by Move On, WAND, and others. And it was really um, WAND and the Fourth Freedom Forum that brought together Move On, True Majority, and Working Assets Long Distance, three internet giants. Uh, and this was right before the first big anti-war demonstration, and we wanted to form a an anti-war coalition that was for everyone, and it wasn't just on the left. But it was a mainstream coalition, and this mainstream coalition brought you something called the Virtual March on Washington, which was to try to stop the war, and also inspired the international vigils that there were 6,000 of them internationally when we did, unfortunately, go to war. And Eli's role in all of that was critical and central. Eli was raised in Maine and graduated from Simons Rock College in Western Massachusetts when he was 19. He was working in Arlington, Massachusetts on September 11th, and he took what was his rejection of the president's demand for vengeance and created an online petition, 9-11peace.org. And in that petition, he urged moderation and restraint. And this became a, a powerful lesson in online or, organizing because he mailed this message to 30 of his friends. But his friends took that message and emailed it to other friends. And a few days later, he got a call saying that his site was crashing because there were too many people who were logging on to the petition. And within two weeks after that, more than half a million people had signed the petition. And Eli was fielding calls from the BBC and South China Morning Post. Quite an auspicious beginning. And the rest is really move on lore. Because it was from that that he was contacted by Wes Boyd and his wife, Joan Blades, the couple who had started moveon.org, which they created during the Clinton problems when they wanted Congress to um, criticize Clinton and move on and get on with the people's business. But Joan and Wes called Eli, and there was a, a merger. And this collaboration brought the world to Eli Pariser and Eli Pariser to the world, and also brought along with it a cadre of young, bright political strategists who still believe in working out of their homes all over the country and using the Internet to organize left-of-center Americans. Now, Eli has titled his presentation tonight, Reclaiming Democracy. And one of the quotes I found when doing a little research on Eli, someone whom, by the way, I feel as if I know very well, but I learned quite a few things by reading some of his history. This was his quote. I don't want to be part of the great left martyrdom story where we simply say we fought the good fight and we lost. I don't want to be on the losing side. So now Eli Pariser, who's 24, is executive director of MoveOn.org and of the political action part. Is that right? Okay. Um, he directed MoveOn's campaign against the Iraq war, tripling MoveOn's member base. They now have over 3.3 million members. Eli was one of the co-creators of the Bush in 30 Seconds ad contest. And as executive director of MoveOn's PAC, he raised over $30 million from 350,000 small donors to run ads, develop a field program, and support progressive candidates at all levels. So I'm very interested in hearing what's next for Eli Pariser. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, thanks. Thanks for coming out, and uh, thanks to Susan, someone who is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I also have to say it's it's really an honor to join the ranks of uh, of, of the other folks who have spoke at the Ford Hall Forum. People like Stephen Jay Gould, Isaac Asimov, Clarence Darrow, and um, and apparently Larry Flint. 
so it's mostly a great honor. And uh, here's hoping that history ranks me closer to the first three than the last one. Um, I wish I could offer, uh, you know, the intellect of Dr. Gould or the imagination of Mr. Asimov or whatever it is that Mr. Flint had to offer, uh, but I but I can't. But what I what I can offer um, is is a bit of perspective because after over the last four years, I've attained a. a an amazing vantage point on American politics, one that certainly surprised me. I've, I've had the opportunity to meet uh, with people from Bruce Springsteen to Al Gore to Andy Stern, but even more importantly, with tens of thousands of real Americans uh, who have dedicated themselves to the task of making this country great. And I'm here tonight to talk about what I've seen, where I think we are, and uh, where we might be going. Uh, before I do that, though, I just want to—I I just can't help myself. So, how many people in the in the room are Move On members already? Oh, great. Well, I'm just going to email the rest of the speech then, and <laughs> I don't—I don't really do public speaking anyway. So, check your email boxes. Thanks. Um, but uh, at a time when uh, the national deficit is skyrocketing and our armed forces are pinned down in a quagmire in Iraq. Uh, when the House Majority Leader and the Senate Leader and the President's Chief Advisor are all under investigation uh, for breaking the law, uh, when fewer congressional seats are up for grabs because of redistricting than ever before, uh, and the President considers it appropriate to repeatedly uh, mislead the American public about critical issues, um, one might conclude that our democracy is in, in pretty deep trouble. And, and I think it is. But that's not what I'm here to talk about tonight. What I'm here to talk about tonight is why I believe there's great hope. So uh, I, I grew up in a small harbor town a little bit up the coast in Maine, and I hope you'll forgive this, this nautical metaphor. But there are three things that you need to move a ship. And so you need wind, uh, you need a sail to catch it, and you need a course uh, to set your ship on. And my report, uh, based on what I can see uh, about uh, where the country is, is that the wind of change is very strong, uh, that together millions of us are building the sails to catch it on, and that it's clear what course we must set the ship on to reach our destination, an America live that lives up to its promise of greatness. So first, let's look at the wind, because uh, the wind of change really is growing. There are lots of ways to tell the story of how we got uh, to this place. Uh, but one version that I particularly like involves uh, lunch uh, a, a, at a meeting of the college Republicans about uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Uh, and there, uh, three young students uh, got together and discussed the possibility of uniting uh, what was a fragmentary uh, and peripheral uh, concern the conservative movement into something that was greater. Uh, one of them said that he was going to look into the uh, religious uh, conservative, the religious right, uh, and get, uh, you know, go deep into that. Uh, another uh, saw the libertarian ideological strand and said, uh, you know, this, uh, and this sounds like a joke, but it's actually not a joke. Uh, there's no rabbi or... Uh, <laughs> So, anyway, the second uh, is, uh, he, uh, said he was going to look into the libertarian uh, strand. Um, and the third uh, said that he was going to think about the business right. Um, and uh, so the three people were Ralph Reed, Grover Norquist, and Jack Abramoff. And uh, that little story is illustrative of the rise to power of uh, this movement and this ideology that has captured uh, our country uh, right now. The ideology, uh, you know, I think it's actually very important not to position uh, the conservative movement as one movement because uh, there are many strands and more even than those three. Um, but they, could, they were able to agree uh, to paper over some differences, uh, and, and those differences remain, and we're actually seeing them right now uh, after the fall of uh, Congressman DeLay, uh, that, that those, dif those fractures still remain. But they were able to paper over them uh, with, with one central idea, uh, which was essentially a, a sink-or-swim ideology. Uh, Grover Norquist 
put it very well uh, when he said that his goal was to shrink government, and I'm paraphrasing, shrink government down to the size uh, where you could drown it in a bathtub. That last part was not a paraphrase. And, um, it, and, and the, the mission here was really to dismantle uh, all of the connections between the citizens and our policy and allow uh, those who are able to get ahead uh, to get ahead and those who were uh, going to fall behind to fall behind. It's a sink or swim uh, ideology. In the, I, I think there could be no clearer example, no clearer uh, image for why the rise of this ideology is a disaster for our country uh, than, than Hurricane Katrina and its aftermath. Uh, the images that we saw in Katrina speak, speak more loudly than uh, any kind of polemic about uh, the state of our country. There was the man uh, who, was sitting, who was standing on his uh, rooftop, uh, unable to find any kind of help uh, after after uh, three days in the city, under, unable to um, to get out because he didn't have the money to to get a bus ticket because it was the end of the month, and the end of the month uh, is the time when when uh, you know when money is really scarce for a lot of folks in this country. Uh, you know, the man who was on his rooftop and saw a plane uh, coming overhead beckoned it uh, and and saw that it was Air Force One, which banked and and flew away. Uh, the, the senior citizen in the nursing home uh, that, we, that we heard about, uh, who was told every day, day after day, uh, that the Calvary is coming, that the Calvary is coming, uh, and they, they never came. Um, these stories uh, are, are, speak more powerfully about the state of our country than, uh, you know, than, than I ever could. Um, and I think what happened with Katrina is that usually uh, people sink or swim uh, in isolation. Uh, usually when you have an unforeseen medical emergency and uh, you have to declare bankruptcy, that happens and no one notices. Uh, but Katrina made the reality that so many people in this country face, uh, that it made it transparent, it made it something uh, that we could all see and that no one could ignore. And uh, it shocked a lot of people because I believe, uh, you know, in our hearts, Americans don't believe us to be a sink or swim nation. But Katrina resonated because it exposed this, this truth uh, that there are so many people who are in these situations where everything seems to be going all right, and then disaster strikes, and the rich are able to drive away, uh, and so many of us are, uh, you know, are left uh, uh, just trying to stay above the surface of the water. You lose your job, you break your arm, your car stops working, and all of a sudden you're in sink or swim mode, you can't make it day to day, and there's no one to haul you out of the water. And uh, that situation is a profound uh, difference from the nation that we know this country is. And it also exposed, I think, the central weakness, the central uh, character flaw in the administration uh, that is running this country right now. I was talking to a journalist recently who uh, has covered Iraq, uh, who's one of the most perceptive uh, uh, people who has been on the ground in Iraq, and he said, you know, I can't fault these people, Paul Wolfowitz and Richard Pearl and, uh, and Donald Rumsfeld. I, I, I don't fault them for having a different I idea than I, for having a different ideological opinion. Um, that's perfectly fine, and while I may disagree, you know, they're entitled to that idea. But I fault them for refusing to admit, to, to admit, in the face of their failure, that the programs that they're promoting are hurting millions of real people. I fault them for refusing to change course. I fault them for, for refusing to help the nation uh, when it's in pain, because they're so blinded by this, by this ideology. And I thought that really uh, sums it up, not just uh, with regard to the war in Iraq, uh, which uh, you know, goes on and on without any end in sight, um, but with regard to so many of the problems uh, that we're seeing right now in our country, uh, that, that this callous disregard uh, for the well-being of, of America uh, became, has, has become increasingly clear. So uh, all of this uh, has, has created a political environment where I believe people are ready for a change. 
They're ready for a change. And uh, the question is, you know, the wind is there. Are there sails to catch it? I think there are. And uh, I think there are as a, as because I've been part of uh, this amazing thing that move on has been part of the, the, the resurgence of the progressive movement. And I, and, um, I want to talk just a little bit about, uh, how I ended up in this position because it's, it offers some insight into, uh, the growing, uh, growing, uh, effort that's underway, uh, to reclaim the country. Susan, uh, told the basic story. Uh, I was working in a nonprofit in Arlington, Massachusetts, more than money. And uh, I was 20 years old uh, after September 11th. And, you know, I was struck by that tragedy the way that all of us were. I went home. I was watching the images on TV, trying to think about what I could do. I called my friends. I knew they were safe. Uh, I, I knew the blood bank had, had more blood than, uh, you know, than it needed. And so I was thinking about what I could do. And I was a web and IT director uh, at this nonprofit, and so I thought, okay, I'll put up a website. So I uh, stayed up late uh, Wednesday night and put together this little website, just articulating the simple idea that it was a it was a moment uh, to seriously consider how to stop terrorism in the long term, as opposed to uh, exacerbating the the problem, causing more violence in the short term, and. Uh, I sent it out to 30 friends and, and really thought that that was it, that I had done what I could do. Uh, I went to sleep feeling like, uh, you know, I had, I had done my job as a citizen. And so a couple, uh, a couple days later when I woke up and checked my email and it just kept downloading and downloading, I knew something was up. Uh, and when it, there, it got to the 3,000 message mark, I really knew something was up. And uh, when I checked the petition online and found that hundreds of thousands of people uh, had signed on to this call, I knew uh, that, that things had, had changed for me. And actually, the point at which it got really scary uh, wasn't so much the, you know, it, it, it was amazing to be part of this coalescence of so many people uh, united with the simple idea in mind. But the part where it got scary was when people started emailing me and saying, OK, what's next? And I said, I don't know, you don't, you tell me. <laughs> I didn't volunteer for this. Uh, but people wanted to make phone calls and I helped them make phone calls. People wanted to write letters and I helped them write letters and, and, uh, and, and slowly this group of people who had came together around this simple idea be- came to form the nucleus of people, uh, who joined with Move On in, uh, raising concerns about the Iraq War in 2002. So that's one small piece of a bigger story, which is that around the country, millions of people, uh, millions of people who mostly haven't been involved in politics before, who don't see themselves as activists, have decided that our country is in enough uh, danger, that the course that we're on uh, is concerning enough uh, that they need to take matters into their own hands. And that's an incredibly encouraging thought. Recently, we... Uh, launched a little website called Hurricane Housing. And Hurricane Housing, after Katrina, allowed people to connect up, uh, to, to open their homes to victims of Hurricane Katrina for a day or two days or a week. And um, I think, it's, and, and recently we asked them, you know, how this experience went. About 30,000 people so far uh, have, have used this service to find uh, a home temporarily uh, after Katrina. And I brought some of the stories uh, from these folks because I think it's such a profound example of the way that people are engaging uh, now. This is one, uh, one account. We were a bit unsure about letting complete strangers into our home, but my husband and I both felt that we, if, if we opened our home in the right spirit, God would bless us in return, and he has done so already. We were blessed to house a young couple like ourselves whose house was completely destroyed by Katrina. Every day they're out the door trying to make things happen for themselves here in Dallas. Amidst all their unfortunate misfortune, they still have time to smile, spend time with us and our neighbors, and even cook special New Orleans meals. That was one uh, one connection. Another that was just amazing to me. I'm on uh, I'm on welfare, and I had to get permission from the housing authority to house evacuees. My story is the poor helping the poor. I don't have a dime, so I couldn't help that way. 
but I do have a roof over my head and a freezer full of food that I was willing to share in order to help out. I'm glad I could help. And this last one, the Kandan parents were about 50 years old from India, but they had, Amer had become American citizens and were living in Algiers. Their two children, grown one a second year medical student, the other a first year engineering student, were bright, beautiful, loving people with a great future ahead of them. Although we are culturally different, they're vegetarians and we're not, they're Hindu and we're Catholic. Their first language, Sanskrit, and another language I can't remember, ours English. We soon f discovered that we found the same things important. Family, love, sharing, responsibility, friendship. <coughs> they wanted the best they could offer for their children as we had when we were raising ours. They had the same concerns about the future as we. All in all, after we passed skin color and other differences, we were the same. All children of God, one in the universe. That was such a refreshing experience, for although we all know this, it's easy to forget. And so this, this practice of taking uh, responsibility for what's going on in the country, uh, for deciding that, uh, for, for people deciding that they themselves are going to uh, get involved in the task of many things when, when they break um, is, is one of the most hopeful things that I know. And millions of people are more engaged than ever. Uh, Move On has grown by 600,000 people since November 2nd. A whole sector of people is getting involved, and it's bigger than Move On because Move On is just one part of a very large uh, progressive movement, people who are working to create change. And so we have the wind and the sails, but what's, what about the destination? A lot of, there's been a lot of talk after the election about values and about, uh, you know, the, the sense of disease that, uh, so many people feel, uh, in this country. And, uh, I believe, and if you, if you read the Zogby polls, a lot of other people do too, uh, that, that the sense of alienation and enemy, uh, comes from a culture of greed that's predicated on a notion that there's no good greater than the self. I think it's this crisis in values uh, that afflicts so many people, that leaves them searching uh, for cultural ways of, of holding on to the things that they believe are important. Um, it's, it's the result of a lack of mission uh, for our country in the world. And uh, there's been a lot of talk recently about, the pre about President Bush's uh, reluctance to ask people to sacrifice. There's a lot of reasons that you might ask people to sacrifice. Uh, but I think perhaps the most important one is that by giving a little bit of themselves, they entwine their destinies with that of the country that they're part of. They, they become part of something bigger. And in a country that doesn't ask anything of its citizens, it's not a surprise uh, that the country's direction seems aimless uh, or, or just flat out wrong. It's what we saw with hurricane housing, that people get back far more than they give. So where do we go? Uh, this is the, the question. What is the mission uh, that our country uh, can fulfill together if we all work together? And uh, I don't have the ultimate uh, four-point plan, but I, I can tell you what I hear from many Move On members again and again and again about uh, the tasks that we could rise to uh, if we were to focus together as a people. One of the most important uh, is the energy uh, crisis that we face. It's not just uh, the fuel prices at the gas pumps. It's uh, the, the global warming that increased the ferocity of those two hurricanes. It's the fact that, uh, you know, that, that oil is, has a very limited future uh, in the world. And uh, we could, and, and I believe we will, uh, lead the world into a post-oil future. Uh, that's something that we could come together and do, make a Apollo-scale investment, uh, you know, a moonshot mission to uh, create an energy independence um, and totally change the world. That's one mission I think uh, we need to take up together. And, uh, and we at Move On certainly will be working hard to, to see that happen. Another uh, is, is leading a world community that works for everyone. And I think with uh, the chaos and tragedy in Iraq, uh, the neoconservative view 
that, uh, you know, that we can dominate the world through military force uh, without bringing people together, without addressing the deeper inequities that exist in the world system uh, has been decisively proven wrong. And it's time for us to come together and exercise some leadership by building the kind of multilateral co collaboration uh, that will truly keep us safe, uh, that will allow us to find uh, the terrorists and to avert future conflict. We uh, have an opportunity now in the wake of Katrina. I think people understand uh, that we, you know, that a rising tide isn't lifting all boats right now and that we desperately need to build a broad prosperity, a broad middle class in this country, that we can't be leaving people behind uh, anymore. And uh, if you look again at the polling, you'll find that people are ready to uh, roll back the tax cuts for the top 1% to make sure that the basic services that, uh, that we need in this country are provided to everyone, uh, regardless if you're, if you're rich or if you're poor. And, uh, and then there's this other issue, which is that I think we're, we're setting a pretty bad example right now uh, for the idea of, of democracy, with Tom DeLay uh, indicted uh, for, for uh, you know, violations of campaign finance law, with uh, Karl Rove in trouble, with, uh, you know, an endless series of uh, corrupt events and, uh, and responses, uh, you know, it's time for some real, uh, to, to really clean up the country. And that's something that we can do together as well. I have faith uh, that we can and we will become as great a nation as, as we can be. I know we have it in, it, uh, in us. And what makes me truly hopeful uh, isn't anything that I hear when I talk to people in Washington or uh, people in other organizations either. It's, it's what I hear uh, talking to people one by one uh, who have decided that if this boat is leaking, they're going to start bailing uh, and maybe even patch up the holes. And seeing so many people uh, make that decision in their lives, make the decision to take responsibility for our common future, uh, I, I think the country is actually in pretty good hands because uh, President Bush's term is going to be over in three years, uh, but ultimately in the long term, I think it's, it's you know, the, the, the future of this country will come down to the number of people uh, who are invested uh, in it. For the last decade and more, uh, the country that we love has been a captive of this ideology which has sought to tear us apart and I think the time is coming to an end. In the simple realization that we're all in this together lies our hope that we'll reach our destination. An America where no child ever goes to sleep hungry. An America where no mother ever has to send her child to a needless war. An America whose greatness can be sustained for our children and our children's children and generations beyond. Thank you. I was sitting here wondering what these guys would have thought about all this on the internet. I'm going to take the prerogative of, of being the moderator and ask the first question. Um, especially since Eli is, is so young, I'm curious to know, but I would ask this question of, of anyone, who your heroes and heroines are. You can say that. Oh. Okay. Uh, I mean, I'm really actually anti uh, a little bit anti-hero worship because I think uh, what I've what I've learned is that a lot of people um, spend a lot of time and energy kind of hoping uh, that leaders will come in and uh, and and you know show the the way forward with blinding clarity and great charisma uh, and I I worry that that impulse uh, stops people from realizing that uh, their their fate and their uh, Six, and, and our common success lies in, in their hands. Um, and so, you know, really, as much as I, as I have heroes, there are these people, uh, like the folks in the hurricane housing 
uh, you know, who wrote us as part of Hurricane Housing, who have just decided, uh, although they're not, uh, you, you know, not the usual suspects, that they are going to jump in and do something. And, uh, and, and what we've seen uh, real Americans accomplish uh, when they've decided that, you know, now's the time to get involved um, is just, is, is extraordinary, is, is my favorite thing to see. Can you see him? Okay, because I didn't know if the podium's in the way. Yes, sir. And then you can line up at the microphone here. And if you um, care to give your name and maybe where you're from. Um, my name is Dr. John Walsh, and I work with uh, Physicians for National Health Program, and I'm a member of the Green Party, among other things. And uh, I'd like to start off by praising Move On for potentially changing how we do politics in this country. But then I'm afraid, and I'm very reluctant having been a Move On member and contributed a lot and even worked with Move On um, in Cleveland uh, before the, in the last presidential election to elect the pro-war candidate John Kerry, which I regret. Um, I have to say that I'm very disappointed in Move On because I find that basically on the question of the criminal war in Iraq, that Move On is basically taking the Democratic Party line. Um, it did very little to organize the last demonstration in Washington. Could you also just ask a question? Yeah, I, but okay. I, I know, but when, when I always find at these forums and you make a criticism, you're asked to be brief, but I'll, I'll be fairly brief. That... Um, and I find that uh, so and move on has not taken a position for getting out of Iraq now, which and 63 percent of the American people, a very broad number, want all or some troops out now. More than that, and most troubling, is that despite entreaties from me and many other members of Move On, you've not even polled your organization on that. And that, the fact that you're basically, you've basically turned into a puppet of the Democratic Party, um, a voice that is not against, that is not for withdrawing now, uh, those are two things that are very serious. But the most serious thing is the last thing. You won't poll your members on this. You, and, and I raised this with Joan Blades at a meeting of PNHP, that it is a profoundly undemocratic organization. Uh, you decide what you're going to poll on, and you only poll on that. And as I say, the entreaties of the members, many of whom I know, to poll on immediate withdrawal go unanswered. Right. Well, I appreciate uh, the, uh, you know, your investment in the organization. And uh, I think, I mean, the, thing, the fact is that we have polled our membership. And... Uh, we have adopted a position, uh, which is that we ought to get an exit strategy in place and that we ought to be out of Iraq by October 2006. That's the position uh, that our members told us that we wanted, and it's something that we take very seriously because one of the things that that uh, that is, is closest to the core of Move On for me uh, is that we serve our members, that this is a member service organization, and that what our members believe uh, is, is our policy. We're not going to be a policy elite. We're not going to take our own ideological positions. We put it in our members' hands. And uh, in July 2005, we sent out a poll to our members uh, asking about this issue. Uh, we saw that actually there was uh, divergence in, in, in our membership. Some people certainly uh, w were deeply committed to the out now position. Other people uh, were deeply opposed to it. And as a membership organization, we felt like it was our responsibility to find the point of consensus. So uh, we talked to many of our members and we found uh, this position in support of the Homeward Bound Act uh, Resolution 55 uh, in the House that 85% of our members uh, strongly endorse. That's uh, how we're going to how we're going to set our policy. And uh, I think 
you know, this, this whole situation is very important to me personally as well, uh, because I was so involved in uh, the buildup to the war in Iraq. Um, and I'm gratified that despite uh, a portion of our membership who was uh, very, very vocally uh, trying to push us to take a position that another portion of our membership strongly disagreed with, that we found the position uh, that had broad support uh, and that that's where the organization stands. Next. I'm, Cynthia, I'm Cynthia Bowman from Cambridge. Um, and I think three years is a long time to have to suffer with Bush. But I was wondering why you think the press was so bad before the election. I mean, there were problems with FEMA before Katrina. Mm -hmm. There were, Iraq was in tough shape, and I don't think the press did its job, and I'd like to have your view on it. I absolutely agree. And I think the problem uh, with the media in this country right now is, is very deep. I think there are two elements to it. One is uh, that you have Fox News and other uh, ideological news sources that are pushing a deliberately biased uh, right-leaning view on American policy. And that, uh, that cadre of reporters is tainting the coverage uh, that we see broadly. And then I think the other problem, which in some ways is deeper, uh, is that uh, th news has come to see itself as uh, just another variety of entertainment uh, and to not hold seriously the public trust uh, that people give it. And uh, so, you know, we, we're working on both of these problems, but especially the former um, through Move On Media Action, uh, which is a campaign where we uh, keep an eye out uh, for uh, times when uh, false ideas make the leap uh, from the right-wing media machine to mainstream news and uh, to call reporters out and call uh, newsp newspapers out when that happens uh, so that, uh, so that you know, it's painful when they accept these lies as, as fact. And, um, and, and that's part of our effort. Uh, I think there's a lot more work to do, uh, certainly, before the media is going to be all right, uh, but, it's, but it's a step. Can you give us an example of, of one of those calling out when, when they accept a, something as fact and put it in the mainstream media? Well, you know, one example is during the Social Security debate, uh, there was Pre President Bush and the Republican Party were putting forward an idea uh, that Social Security was going to go bankrupt uh, in 2043, I believe. And um, it's, a, it's just not true that Social Security is going bankrupt or can go bankrupt because since it's since money is paid into it every year, uh, it will always have some operating funds. It's true that less uh, less than the amount that we would uh, need for benefits would be available, um, and so you know reporters started picking up this word bankrupt, um, and we challenged them on that because uh, you know it simply wasn't an accurate uh, positioning for for the problem. Yes. Hi, thank you. I'm a member of Move On, and I have a comment. I think you could be proud to be on the list of speakers with Larry Flint. He's done an amazing job working for the First Amendment. Mm. And I wanted to give you this. The turnout's a little meager, but the Yankees are in town. And I just wanted <laughs> to... <laughs> The Red Sox won. The Red Sox won. And um, I did have a comment. I think one of the major problems we have as a nation is that of the mistaken Supreme Court decisions in the end of the 1800s where corporations were given the rights of citizens. And so now we have corporate citizenship. And so they've slowly infiltrated government and our whole lives. And, and, there, and because of the name of your um, speech tonight of Reclaiming Democracy, there's a group called ReclaimDemocracy.org mm -hmm. that's working on this issue with helping local places and uh, 
have city councils and local governments overrule corporate interests in, in favor of citizens. And I'm wondering if you have heard of the group, if you've been in contact with them, is that an issue that Move On would work on? Or do you make coalitions with other groups mm -hmm. like that? We work with a lot of other groups, and uh, the way that we do that, the way that we usually choose uh, those alliances is, uh, as I said before, you know, we see our first and foremost mission to work on whatever are the most important issues to the 3.3 million people who make up Move On. And uh, when people say, you know, I, I, this is an issue that I care about, uh, we look into who's working in that area and we work with, uh, you know, the best and, and most capable folks in that area. In terms of the issue of, uh, you know, of, of corporate distortion of the political system, that's sort of one of the deep issues that I think comes up in a lot of the, a lot of the work that we do, whether it's, uh, you know, this upcoming budget bill, which is trying to cut uh, $900 billion uh, in, in services for people or, uh, you know, any of the, or, or the energy, uh, the energy issues that are so critical to the future of the country. Um, you know, th th this issue, the same people are always on the other side. Uh, and so it's something that we think a lot about how to, uh, you know, how to, in the course of each of these sort of one-off uh, you know, one-time fights, build the broad coalition um, that can match uh, the amount of money and influence that, that big companies are putting into politics. So do you, th do you think instead of small groups, although Move On is in particular small, but using up resources separately that somehow there could be a more of a convergence as time goes on? Well, I think, I mean, I think this is one of the things that we think about a lot, and it's, I think there's a value to having a movement rather than one coalition. Um, there are actually a lot of coalitions in progressive politics, and mostly uh, people spend a lot of their time in meetings and a lot of their time, uh, you know, distributing minutes and have, uh, electing officers. And um, it's an exception that, uh, that coalitions like Win Without War you know, that actually get together and do something. And so uh, I think having a, a, a large group of loosely affiliated organizations that are working together with a common purpose, that know each other, uh, and that are able to tap each other when, when the moment arises for them to more closely collaborate, uh, makes more sense than, you know, trying to get everyone into, you know, the, the, the one vehicle. Thanks so much. Yes, next. Hi, um, my name is Amanda Smith. I'm from Malden, um, also a Move On member. Um, one of the things that I'm curious to see, you, you presented a really positive, optimistic um, picture. Um, and I think there are times when we all feel that way, and then there are other times when we feel really, really pessimistic or, mm -hmm. or you know, feeling really hopeless. And I think I'm probably not the only person who had those feelings following Katrina. Um, and one of the things that that I see um, that concerns me greatly is there is this convergence of progressive activity and there are a lot of hopeful signs, but right below the surface is, you know, sort of the perennial cancer, I think, that afflicts this country, which is racism, that mm. no one wants to talk about or deal with. I mean, class is also, you know, equally a problem, but, um, <laughs> you know, there are a lot of people who call themselves Democrats or progressives or even liberals who vote against progressive candidates or legislation because, God forbid, someone who's black or Latino benefit from, you know, Medicaid, education. I mean, you could go down the list, and it's a very painful truth mm -hmm. that I think too many of us involved with progressive activism, we don't want to think that negatively about people that we might agree with on certain things. And I just see it as a stumbling block that Do you I, I, it just, it's really hard to figure out how to deal with it. And I'm wondering if that's come up for you, um, you know, a lot, and whether you have any thoughts on how we as a progressive movement can deal with that issue and not be um, taken advantage of because uh, race is so effectively used by the other side. Right. It really is a... So, oh, sorry. sorry. Yes. I thought I was speaking right. The, the question was how do we, <laughs> how do we avoid uh, the, uh, the, the stumbling block that, um, that racial issues present 
for uh, our movement and moving forward. Is that more or less? And do you think there's hope? That's a very nice, succinct way of answering my <laughs> rambling <Thanks>. question. <laughs> um, and, you know, I don't think there's an easy answer, yeah. uh, but I think that maybe the first, uh, you know, it's, it's like a 12-step pro program where the first, the first step is admitting that we have a problem. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I think that, you know, that is happening, it has happened. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the, you know, the, the next, I mean, I, I think the experience that many uh, black and Latino, but especially black uh, activists had in the 1990s was that uh, when welfare reform and when other issues were going down mm -hmm. that were going to deeply affect uh, their communities, no one uh, a across the divide stood up uh, and said, we're with you, we're going to fight with you, um, this is really important. And I think part of the reason for that is that there weren't a lot of organizations that were actually positioned to do multi-issue work. Uh, Move On you know, is, is still fairly rare in the pantheon of progressive organizations in being willing to go uh, and address many issues. So uh, I know with Katrina, you know, this is part of part of what we're thinking about, and we're working with the NAACP very closely. Um, but more broadly, I think the emergence of organizations that can, that understand how important it is to stand with those folks mm -hmm. when, uh, you know, when their communities are threatened, um, you know, that's a big part of, of the answer. Can I just say I'm really glad you mentioned the multifaceted organizations because I really do think that's an important component of sort of the new movement, and I think it gives me hope because we're not all fractured. So I right. think that's really positive. Thank Great. you. Hi, I'm Judy Mabel from Brookline. I'm a member. And um, after the election, you sent all your members a questionnaire on what was important, and I spoke very strongly about the environment and having a world left to leave our children and grandchildren. And it, tangentially, you talked about energy, global warming, and oil, and I'm wondering if you have any action items coming up to specific that you know of either in your organization or another organization. Right. You know, I think actually it's it's very germane. Did you hear the question? The, sorry, the, the question was, uh, what can we do in the near future about the energy and oil uh, issues that we face? And um, it's actually very germane because uh, at the end of this week, the House is going to vote on an extremely, um, it's sort of the opposite of a good energy bill. Uh, it's opening up huge swaths of the country to development for oil, uh, which will not get us a whole lot of oil, but which will um, ruin a lot of beautiful parts of the country. Um, and so we're going to be having our members work on that, but also uh, there is uh, this this big vision project called the Apollo Project um, that we're involved with, which is pushing a uh, you know a large a ten billion dollar investment in a real uh, solution to the energy problems. And so I think you know the the we'll be working on both sides, both stopping further damage uh, and trying to advance this notion. As far as you know, I think for our members, this hasn't been as hot an issue uh, in, in, in aggregate. Uh, but with Katrina, with the skyrocketing gas prices and with uh, the threat of hurricanes that are much stronger than they used to be, I think what we've seen is that a lot of people are, are there now. And so we're looking for every opportunity to, uh, to take that on. And thanks for being part of those house parties after the election. It, as a follow-up to that question, are you organized the way some other, like, working assets and I think true majority are organized? So if something were happening in Massachusetts, yeah. say on energy, you could do something just with Massachusetts legislation? Well, it's true, although we actually mostly focus on national issues because if we were going to do state-level issues everywhere, it, was, it would be, you know, we'd have to be a... Uh, 70-person organization. Right now, we're a 12-person organization, and it would it would kind of change our fundamental nature if we were trying to do um, trying to do that. Yes. Hi. Hi, I'm Marsha from Brookline. That's my very question. It's a state issue, but I'm one of many people working on an initiative petition to get the Massachusetts National Guard out of Iraq. We hope to export it nationally, but meanwhile, we have to collect 100,000 signatures in the next six weeks. Is there any way mass move on? or move on in Massachusetts mm -hmm. can get the information out to its members uh, or 
I mean, as I said, I think we're trying to figure out how we can support these kind of state level initiatives because what we don't want to do, you know, uh, what we don't want to do is in those states where I happen to speak or where someone happens to know me that we support certain things and then in a lot, you know, we want to have kind of a systematic approach to the issue. That said, this sounds like a really important thing and, it's also something you know, we that can. 24 other states can do. Massachusetts is right. the first one doing it, so it really does have some national. Right. Broad well, let me. I mean, we'll we'll take a close look at it. I wasn't aware of it, but um, but let me take a look and and we'll see what we can do. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. Next. Thanks. My name is Michael Connolly. I live in Cambridge. Um, I'm going to praise you for one innovation and then ask a question about a challenge and a concern. An example of how Move On has innovated. Um, at least the one that I participated in as a member, are these alerts that you've sent out where a regulatory action, which is usually nowhere, you know, it may be on page 27 of the New mm -hmm. York Times and usually like after it's too late. Um, and I'm thinking of the FCC, a variety of things in the FCC, but many, um, it's been really gratifying to get the news in advance and to be part of several hundred thousand people um, speaking up. And occasionally that seems to have had an impact. Yeah. And I'm sure that it's pissed off a lot of people. Or rather, also I'm sure true. it's pissed off a small group of people. Um, so I think in that way you've changed politics. In another way, I'm really concerned, though, about the overall context. I think if you look around the world in the last 50 years, and even in the last five, you would have to say that the most progressive force in every country has been the trade union movement. Mm -hmm. These are people who fight not just for their own members, but for everyone. And we wouldn't be having an eight-hour day right. or a five-day work week or, all, or Social Security, all sorts of things we wouldn't have if it hadn't been for the trade, movement, trade union movement, which is mm, not doing too well in the United States or in any other advanced industrial democracy. We're just the worst. Um, so... That's uh, the question that's on my, I think a lot of uh, <coughs> political organizing is not about individuals talking to their representatives. That's a process. Mm -hmm. There's also all these institutional, you build institutions that, and, and I'm wondering at Move On how you think about trade unions and the labor movement. And I have no particular, right. I, I'm not asking you to do anything because I'm totally puzzled by this. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's been a deliberate strategy since President Bush got into the White House to try to dismantle as much as possible the apparatus that makes unions possible and makes them thrive. And we're seeing another example of that in California, uh, where there's initiative, an initiative on the ballot that would dramatically curtail um, the activities of, of unions in California. It's one of the biggest states for unions nationwide, obviously. Um, so this is a deliberate uh, campaign. And uh, we work, you know, I, it's not, frankly, a world that I know um, in, in depth. I don't know what the, what the big solution is, and certainly they're having a lot of conversations um, inside uh, that community. But what I can tell you is that when uh, these threats emerge, we try as much as possible to engage Move On members in fighting them um, because that's such a, such a big part of the puzzle. And so we're in touch with the AFL, we're in touch with the folks at, at Change to Win, and, you know, when, when, and, and they tell us when, when Move On members can have an impact, and we try to get that out. Um, it's not the big solution, and I, and I don't know, uh, you know, I think the, the start to a big solution involves a, a new, uh, you know, a change in, uh, in Congress where we can start enacting some of the legislation that's, that's been cut back. Um, but, uh, you know, but for now, that's what we can do. Thank you. Yeah. And Carolyn Fuller from Cambridge. Hi. And I had the honor of meeting Paul Hackett um, mm -hmm. last weekend or the weekend before. Did he, has he decided, did, or have you heard anything about, is he thinking about running for the Senate? Uh, he is. Okay, you'll have to explain for this audience mm -hmm. who sure. Paul Hackett is. So Paul is, Hackett so. is this amazing guy uh, who came back from Iraq and decided that he was going to run for Congress in one of the most conservative districts in, uh, in Ohio as a Democrat. And, uh, well, he didn't win the special, special. election. Uh, sorry, it was a special election, so it was this August. 
Uh, he didn't win, but he won 48 percent of the vote in a district that went just hugely overwhelmingly for Bush, um, and and did so by by saying, you know, that the way that the war was prosecuted was totally irresponsible, that Bush was a chicken hawk, and, uh, you know, really a very feisty guy. Uh, it seems very likely, although I haven't talked to him yet, uh, that he is going to run for the Senate. And uh, our members have actually contributed about one hundred and sixty or one hundred seventy thousand dollars that will be there, you know, the first day that he uh, announces, so that he'll be ready to spring into action uh, with funds to to do to do the work. Uh, who's he running? Who would he run against the Senate? Uh, he would run against Mike DeWine, uh, who's a, who's a Republican senator. He's in deep trouble, um, and and Ohio in general is just kind of shaping up to be a perfect storm because uh, between, uh, between this Senate race and uh, the fact that the governor uh, invested, I, I don't fully understand the story, but basically invested a huge portion of the pension funds in these coins that were not legitimate, <laughs> uh, you know, there's a real opportunity for a change. The other thing that's really important, and I just have to say, uh, is on this November, uh, in Ohio, there is there are four uh, uh, amendments to the Constitution, which are really important um, because not only will they uh, conceivably they'll redistrict Ohio in a nonpartisan way, which means that uh, Democrats could gain up you know a number of seats in the House uh, right you know very shortly thereafter, but uh, also it'll fix uh, some of the deepest problems with the Ohio election system, which we all know didn't work very well last time. So if you have a chance, go to reformohionow.org or .com, give them some money. They need our help, uh, and, and it's a very exciting thing uh, if, they, if they pass even just a couple of those four uh, provisions. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Spencer. I'm from Brookline. Um, closer to the mic. Okay. Um, in, in any problem that we have, whether it's a personal problem or a larger problem like global warming or the war in Iraq or Social Security, uh, what, what we need is not only people saying that they don't like the way things are going, but actually a, a solution, um, sort of a detailed plan, like this is what we're going to do. So my question is, um, and I mean, we, we've typically looked to Congress to work out these plans for us, mm -hmm. but unfortunately they seem unable to do that. So where does Move On look to um, for these solutions? Um, like, who do you have, uh, where, do you, where do you look to for proper policy? That's a great question. And, um, you know, one of the things that we've always been very clear on is that we're actually not a a policy organization. We're not going to come up with, you know, we don't think it's our role to sit in a room somewhere and try to come up with the perfect uh, plan. And so we work with uh, organizations that have expertise in those areas to, uh, you know, to, to, to figure out what the policy is that will best, <coughs> excuse me, uh, best represent uh, where our membership is at. Uh, on Iraq, as, as an example, um, we worked a lot with Tom Andrews, who leads the Win Without War Coalition. And he, uh, you know, he's been talking with a lot of experts and, um, you know, developed the kind of the intellectual case for uh, a timeline for exit, which, uh, which essentially is that uh, it, it allows for a period of time where people in that country know that they have to make the political deals uh, you know, that f to, to have stability while we're gone, but uh, there's still uh, the United States in there to, uh, uh, you know, to, to help that process along. So, uh, you know, that we look to people who are experts uh, to help us find the positions that best represent our members is the short answer. When you, when they give you a policy, uh, what you do is essentially sort of petition for it and try to just get support for it. Yeah, I mean, we we also look, we work with people on the Hill, on Capitol Hill, to find legislation that best represents that policy. And uh, people in this room probably have been asked far too many times to make phone calls on behalf of those 
uh, of those uh, pieces of legislation, but um, you know we have been able uh, to move legislation along. Uh, right now, it's very difficult because uh, with Republicans in control of the House and the Senate, um, you know, good legislation uh, is very hard to to pass, um, and so we find ourselves, you know, mostly blocking further damage. Um, but I think at this moment in time, actually, there's an opportunity to step out with some bold proposals that can really take the country in a new direction. We're working with folks on that. Um, and just one last thing. Um, Could you speak louder, please? Yeah, one last thing is that um, when this policy is created and suggested to you, um, is it open to the public so that there is a chance for um, sort of democracy in action, people can comment on it, um, sort of say how they feel about it, maybe suggest a different idea for? Well, the way that we, you know, do this, it starts with our members and we're constantly asking them in a variety of ways, you know, what what they want to see. Um, one of the things that I think is important about Move On is it allows people who don't have time or interest in being, uh, in being uh, in meetings and uh, you know policy deliberations, who just want a simple thing that they can do that's quick that helps them move toward uh, their goal. Uh, you know that that we focus on serving those folks, and so uh, we don't do a lot of process with with rounds and rounds of uh, policy. We try to find something that that meets where our members are, um, offer them the opportunity to weigh in it and in on it, and if we get it wrong, uh, then you know, then we don't require our members to do anything. There's always other uh, actions to do, and we certainly hear about it, uh, and and that keeps us honest. I might mention that, um, and I'm sorry the gentleman who asked the first question left, because there are lots of bills on the table that move on as, and other groups like WAND have considered on Iraq, but they're just not going to win. The Republicans are not going to allow them to move forward under any circumstances, so sometimes it's a political decision. That's right. So should we do one more or two more questions? Something well, we'll finish with these three people, okay. and then we'll be Great. Yes, next. Hi, my name's Jane Dimitri. I live in Boston. I'm a Move On member. Um, I'd just like to make a comment that I feel um, the biggest threat to our democracy in this country is through the use of unfair voting practices, uh, specifically through the use of electronic voting machines that mm -hmm. have no paper trail and can be very easily tampered with. Um, I think it's no coincidence that all the states in the 2004 election that had electronic voting machines were swing states. And it is my dire hope that move on, take this very seriously, yeah. um, and not just six months before the next election right. now. This is something that we hear a lot from people. And so let me, so the situation with uh, electronic voting is there are a couple bills uh, in the Senate and the House that are very good, you know, that would basically solve the problem, mandate federally that there be paper trail uh, voting. Uh, right now, uh, Republicans in both chambers will not let those bills go to the floor. And it's actually interesting because in the House, um, we, we might be able to win a bill if people were allowed to vote on it. They're not allowed to vote on it. So uh, we're trying to break that deadlock. Uh, but at the same time, because it's such an urgent issue, um, we're, you know, we're looking at the state level bills, uh, that are in play. And in every state, uh, where there is a bill that'll fix this problem, uh, engaging our members, we've actually won a couple of victories, uh, at the state level fixing this problem. And I think it may be for the next couple of years that it's a state by state fix. It's not ideal, um, but it's, it's, it's the best that we can do, uh, in, in a bad spot. Um, one other thing that I'll say about this issue uh, is that uh, the, the woman who was talking about, uh, you know, this issue is part of um, broader problems with our uh, voting system. And uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is to bring together the different groups of folks uh, who are interested. You know, this issue has a certain, has, has a constituency 
a lot of move on members care a lot about it, but issues like uh, you know election day registration or um, you know really making uh, or, or the lines at the polls uh, that we all heard about in Ohio uh, are also important and so we 're trying to uh, you know bring all of those issues together uh, you know rather than just focusing you know, rather than playing whack a mole with this critically important issue and having others then come up next thanks. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Merritt Harrison from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And um, the concern I bring is a concern about overpopulation uh, on, on our planet. Uh, in the, just <clears throat> one statistic, uh, in the last 35 years, the population of the planet has doubled from 3 billion to 6 billion. Uh, <clears throat> and it's a very frightening prospect if this rate of growth continues. Uh, and, you know, in our country, under the Bush administration, we have taken a very backward point of view about this, and uh, certainly the uh, Supreme Court is perhaps on the verge of reversing uh, uh, Roe versus Wade and, and um, <clears throat> a woman, woman, woman's right for choice. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so, what is Move On doing in, in this area of overpopulation and, and the uh, woman's right to choose? It's a good question. Um, you know, as I said, we're, you know, we take our cues from our members largely. Mm -hmm. And uh, this issue is not one that we hear, uh, you, you know, specifically the issue of overpopulation is not something that we hear a lot from our members about. So, um, you know, I think we try to be a multi-issue organi organization, and we work on a lot of different issues. It naturally means that some, uh, you know, don't don't get uh, don't get the attention that they deserve. And um, you know, luckily, we're in a movement with a lot of other groups who also uh, can serve people. We we can and we can't be the um, one-stop shopping, and we don't want to be uh, for the progressive movement. We're just one one piece of the puzzle. And the other question I have is on a more personal level. Uh, in 12 years, do you plan to run for president? <laughs> no. And if not, why not? <laughs> uh, no, it seems like a, um, a pretty tough uh, job. But more importantly, uh, you know, I think the, the, the place that I love to be is representing, uh, you know, once you, once you make the leap uh, to being a politician and being kind of on that side of the fence, um, you know, you have to engage in a series of compromises. And um, the place that I love to be is being able to passionately advocate uh, for real people without having to uh, coach, you know, couch, couch what I believe. I think, though, what we're looking for are more candidates who don't have to compromise and That's true. have an ideological But core. it's also, it's, it's that, uh, you know, I think it's our job to create the, you know, I think this gets back to the first question about the heroes, and um, you know, and there's this idea that that we could just elect someone who would be perfect and they would solve all the problems. And I think the fact is that the political space, you know, it's our responsibility to create the political space for for leaders to lead, and then it's their responsibility to to seize it. Um, but it's a two-way street, and I think if if you don't make it possible. Uh, for for people to take a position uh, that's bold, you know they're they're just not going to because it's a it's a suicide. Well, we're counting mission. on you to do that in 12 years. So if you happen, <laughs> well, we had said this would be the last last question, but we'll make it yours as long as your questions are brief. Okay. All right. Hi, I'm Carol Walter Gustus in Boston, and I've been listening to this parade of issues, and it speaks to. Um, the brilliance of what MoveOn has done in my mind of being sort of the high point of the electrical, you know, the, the lightning rod where all everything in the energy and the atmosphere can be grounded mm -hmm. down and here's what you can do tomorrow. And that's, that's exciting. Mm -hmm. And it came from um, your particular one-person action, and that's the brilliance, right? That's the democratic principle. Um, I just finished teaching teachers. I was at a university, uh, and my question is coming straight from that experience. My experience is that students who are going to be teaching uh, all over the, the country 
are really kind of shallow. They have a, a short bench, just came from the Red Sox, so, uh, short, shallow bench mm-hmm. uh, in terms of understanding anything like about democracy. And they may have some new hit from Move On and from the kind of exciting things that are in the air. Um, but those <laughs> catchphrases aren't enough. And it, so there's a next step to sort of getting, well, how is the environment and the racism and this connected? Mm -hmm. And there is a big picture, Mm -hmm. and there's been a progressive history. So my question is, do you see a place for Move On in um, pointing people to next steps beyond um, the action steps? You know, in in other words, I grew up a red state kind of kid, mm-hmm. and it was the teach-ins that happened in the 60s that were very personal. What do you mean my country does that? Mm-hmm. You know, and that kind of innocence that gets transformed to being very powerful political action, that's sort of some people have started, what do you mean my country is this? Right. And I think, I mean, the, the short answer uh, is that you know, we, what we can do is we can provide the fora and the connections uh, where that deepening of uh, experience and, and um, under understanding can happen. But we never want to be a let-me-tell-you organization. You know, we never want to say, uh, this is the way that you must analyze uh, the politics of this country. Um, our role is to serve people in, in taking actions that will change the, the country and the world. And and that's, you know, and, and I think we have to leave it to others to, um, you know, to do the education and, the, and that piece. Thanks. One more question. I enjoyed greatly your presentation tonight. Uh, my name is Sapers, and I'm from Cambridge. And I just hope you will consider a high priority for another aspect of electoral reform, which is to change our notion about congressional districting. And 45 years ago, in a democratic (coughs) reform movement in Massachusetts, we were able to come up with coherent, compact, equal, and most importantly, competitive congressional districts. Even though we were nominally a democratic reform group, um, we were laughed out of the legislature in those days, and V.O. Key, who some of you may remember, was a great expert on election laws, uh, told me, don't be silly, I won't say anything in your favor, it's just too preposterous to think of using redistricting to create competitive congressional districts. Right. Of course, that was the whole purpose of electing congressmen every two years. And we now live in a time in which they're all frozen in, And it's a deal made in most states where, except in Texas, where they don't make deals like this anymore, but a deal made where we'll let the Republican have a safe district and the Democrat will have a safe district. That's not what we want. Absolutely. And it's uh, I I have a sense, 45 years have passed, I think the circumstances are different now. I have a sense with the slight movement toward nonpartisan redistricting yeah. committees that are not part of the legislature, an effort in, I think, Ohio and in California. Sir, do you have a question? What? Do you have a question? No, I'm going to finish, though, quickly. <laughs> My question was at the beginning. You didn't hear me. I said I, I would like it if Move On would put this at a high priority level. Right. And so... Um, I think this issue that you raise, the issue uh, that fewer and fewer congressional districts are competitive, um, is uh, is critical. It's it's one of the deepest problems, I think, with American politics, and it's a problem which has been created not just by Republicans but by Democrats as well, who have been more interested in uh, you know building the institution of the Democratic Party than actually letting uh, democracy uh, happen, and. Uh, you know, the, the Reform Ohio Now initiative, actually, one of the, I, I believe that the first priority, the, the, the highest uh, uh, criteria by which they're judging, uh, which the, by which they would judge uh, re, uh, uh, district maps is how many competitive districts 
they have, with the more con competitive districts being the better. That's one very concrete, very soon, and very urgent uh, way to get at this problem, and it's only one state. But I think uh, as more and more states see themselves inching toward really nasty battles uh, on redistricting, uh, this is going to look more and more promising. And, um, and it also just speaks to the bigger picture, which is that I think, um, you know, the control of American politics by, uh, by two parties, uh, you know, Democrat and Republican, uh, doesn't allow for the dynamism that's, that's necessary. And, what's, and uh, that's why it's so important that so many people who are outside of those party structures uh, get involved because uh, they can provide the torque and uh, the impetus necessary for parties which basically seek uh, their own continuation to stand for something more. So thank you so much for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you.